The Pentium 4 and the Netburst architecture. Arguably one of the most iconic, if not infamous, chips Intel ever shipped. And from its inception all the way to its retirement, it struggled to succeed, ultimately being axed in its entirety in favor of the more efficient core architecture. But did you know there was actually a full-blown Netburst on steroids project in the works, reaching clock speeds upwards of 7 GHz, named Tejas and Jayhawk? These chips. Today we're not only going to have a look at these chips, but I've also been in touch with one of the Intel engineers who actually worked on the Tejas project. So let's get started. To better understand these chips, let's first give some context. For decades, CPUs were generally sold by their clock speed. More frequency, the better. In general, with every new generation of CPU, you move to a new process node, which allows you to do two things. First, it gets you more transistors in a given area. But secondly, it allows you to raise the clock frequency while keeping power relatively constant. And consumers expected a newer CPU to run faster than their old previous CPU. And this recipe held true for a long time. But around 2000, cracks were starting to show as power and heat increased massively. And when the time came to replace their old Pentium 3, Intel decided to cling on to this old strategy, desperately continuing to push clock speeds even further with the Netburst Pentium 4. And the main trick to the Netburst architecture was deepening the pipeline from 10 stages with the Pentium 3 to 20 stages with Willamette and Northwood. And what this allows to do is to reduce the complexity of work the CPU needs to do at every step in the pipeline, which in turn allows it to run at a higher clock speed. Now it also gets less work done on every step in the pipeline, but this is hopefully offset by the increased clock frequency. And for the first two generations, this worked out reasonably well, especially Northwood, the second generation, was quite well regarded. But for a moment now, let's take a step back. Your Intel circa 2003, and in two generations of CPUs, you've nearly tripled their power consumption. What do you do? Do you either rethink your strategy, or do you double down on it? Well, during the Intel Developers Forum 2003, we got the answer, as Intel presented Prescott, with now a whopping 31 pipeline stages, and quoting a frequency of 4 to 5 gigahertz. In practice, however, Prescott was quite literally a hot mess, only managing to outpace Northwood by sheer clock speed advantage. Now, the issue is, is that modern CPUs try to predict what they have to do next, a process known as branch prediction. And if this is done well, it can greatly uplift performance. However, if these predictions aren't true, the pipeline needs to be emptied and refilled again. And deeply pipeline architectures suffer more greatly from these mispredictions and are also more difficult to keep topped up. Now, Intel hoped that Prescott's advanced branch prediction and extra cache and, of course, massive clock speed would make up for this, but it didn't. And during that same IDF 2003, we also got news of a new mysterious chip called the Tejas, which would follow up from the then still to be released Prescott. And on the server side, they talked about Jayhawk, the Xeon variant of Tejas. And in a press release, these were revealed to be 90 nanometer products. And overall, Intel kept quiet about these chips until suddenly on May 7th, 2004, they announced the complete cancellation of the Tejas and Jayhawk chips, saying that they would continue to go to dual core designs instead, with Paul Ottolini citing that if we had not started making this right hand turn, we would have run into a power wall. You just can't ship desktop processors at 150 watts. Well, not exactly prophetic words there, but at least it would have given us a sort of ballpark figure on what the Tejas chips would have consumed. And this is also just big news. You just don't cancel a CPU project like that that late in its development, as it is a multi-year effort involving millions and millions of dollars. This would have been a big blow to Intel at the time. Finally, buried in the Intel Analyst meeting 2004, Intel dropped some of the final details we'd know about Tejas showing a picture with a die comparison, showing that Tejas would have had a die size of 213 square millimeters, which is absolutely massive for a single core chip and nearly twice the size of Prescott. 
which would have been the end of the Teha story, except in 2018, 14 years later, these emerged. Now John Culver from the CPU shack got hold of a mysterious bunch of LGA-771 chips, and via ROHS documentation these were found to be labeled as GA holes. And possibly also one of the earliest known LGA-771 chips, dating from April 2004, just weeks before Tejas and Jayhawk were cancelled. And I was able to buy a pair of these from him. And since then I've been on a search to find out more about these chips and about the Tejas and Jayhawk project in general. What are these chips? And what were the finer details of Tejas? And amazingly, I've been able to get in touch with Steve Fisher, who was one of the engineers who worked on the Tejas project and later went on to be the lead architect on Penryn, the follow-up from Conroe. He was open to sharing some information he could recall about Tejas, some of which has never been published before. And the following contains information from emails and questions I've had back and forth with him and his career memoir. For a start I asked what he could recall of Tejas and what his involvement was in the project. And he said, Tejas was primarily led and developed by an engineering team based in Austin and the Folsom processor development team playing a large assisting role. Folsom had more IA and design for manufacturability expertise, based on earlier P6 and P4 derivative product developments, while the Austin team was newer to Intel but with some different microarchitecture expertise brought in from outside, like former PowerPC engineers. I came into this project late, having spent a couple of years doing something completely different at one of Intel's acquisitions during the dot-com boom. Then back after returning to Intel, I focused on microcode development, with these efforts first being applied on Prescott and then later on Tejas, the latest greatest P4 product. The thing had a pipeline depth of around 50 stages and an expected clock target at one point north of 7 GHz. I call the thing the Death Star of processors and half-jokingly reasoned that consumer acceptance of liquid-cooled chassis would not be a big deal. By mid-2004 I believed I'd moved on to lead the microarchitecture activities on a different approach with the Penryn project. <laughs> so geez, that's absolutely wild. A 50-stage pipeline, 7 GHz, nicknamed the Death Star. And even the fastest Pentium 4, which was a 3.8 GHz at 115 watts, I'd say for 7 GHz we'd probably be looking at 250 watts plus easily. So yeah, definitely water cooling. But Man, I really would have loved to have seen this chip actually be a product. Then I was also interested in what this was like within Intel at the time, because at that time already work was being done on the foundations of what the core microarchitecture would become, which was really vastly different from this blazing hyper-pipelined Tejas approach. And he said, This multiple team approach is quite common at Intel. It is healthier and encourages a more competitive product development. At the time, as also on many other products, there was a lot of debate between which architecture direction was best. Even within the teams, there's been a lot of debate. Tejas, in a way, was taking the P4 microarchitecture to an even further extreme, while many believed that this was a dead end due to its extreme use of pipelining and the power implications that came with it. While the more recent trend towards mobility and lower power implied the Miron direction to be the better choice. After Miron team was showing very favorable results and given these doubts, it was decided at a corporate level to kill Tejas and double down on the Miron microarchitecture. So yeah, even within Intel they knew perhaps this approach wasn't best, but still interesting to hear. But what about these chips? Are they real? Because there are plenty of people, including John Culver I bought them from, who think that as they are labeled as TV, that they are only thermal or mechanical samples. So. He commented, the photo of these samples look legit. 2004 is the year in which the project was cancelled after having some early silicon results. And I believe these are probably actual silicon. The A4 stepping designation makes that implication, as it would be highly unlikely to have that many revisions for a thermal or mechanical sample. So yeah, that is fantastic news that there is a good chance that these contain some actual 50 pipeline silicon. But how far did these early silicon results get? I was curious. So he replied, I believe they were able to boot some common OS's like Windows and Linux, but it did require multiple iterations and some custom platform firmware and microcode patches, along with potentially some platform hardware adjustments. So it is very doubtful anyone outside would make these, would be able to make these operable. So yeah, it's not likely that these are 
actually going to work, but we of course need to try for ourselves. To start, I tried a Supermicro X7 DBU, which has the older Intel 5000P chipset. I carefully installed one of the samples, and while the motherboard did turn on, it then did absolutely nothing, just a black screen is all we got. Then I also installed two chips with less memory, but still got nothing. Then I figured perhaps this board just simply can't supply enough power, we need more power. So I risked it and dug out my Intel Skull Trail board, which has the newer Intel 5400 chipset. I removed the Core 2 Quad Extremes and installed the chips. If there's any motherboard capable of powering these chips, then it's this board. The LED is on. Nothing has exploded yet. But perhaps unsurprisingly, we still got nothing. Here I also tried with two chips installed and reducing the memory and so on, but nope, unfortunately not. But say Tejas had succeeded, would it have been the Pentium 5? Well, he replied, who knows how product planning at Intel would have ultimately positioned it. Their naming seems to confound and surprise even most of the engineers working directly on these products. It would depend on its results, other products, competition and the market needs at the time. But I believe Teos would have more naturally fit in the networks product line. So, no, unfortunately no concrete evidence that it would have been the Pentium 5, but I'd like to imagine that it was. But what happened after the project was cancelled? How did the people react who worked on it? And he replied, many kind of knew it was coming by the time Silicon arrived. Of course, cancelling a project that many spent years of their heart and soul on never feels good, but when you look back, the clarity of the decision seems justifiable in this case. So yeah, many people who worked on it knew that it was coming. But after it was ultimately cancelled, was anything done in order to prevent another failure project like this from happening? To which he replied, yes, I believe more focus was given on how to improve the harmony of the teamwork for such multiple side developments going forward and potentially define one side to be the clear decision maker. There was a lot of angst between the sides due to one considered potentially more idealistic and skilled on processor architecture, Austin, and the other side that better understood the importance of legacy IA compatibility, overall system performance and manufacturability, Folsom in this case. Even making statements like this can trigger some debates from those that might not share this point of view, but it is mine. So it is interesting to hear some of the insight into how such a multiple site development works and also how these sites differ from each other in terms of skill set and knowledge. But in the end, was anything reusable out of the efforts that went into the Tejas and Jayhawk projects? To which he replied, I believe some of the microarchitecture innovations to improve IPC had carry over to future products, along with some circuit innovations, platform level innovations like front side bus, and ISA, Instruction Set Architecture Extension Development, but I can't talk about these specifically. So at least it's good to know that all of this effort wasn't for nothing. And on a side note, to this day, Socket 775 and Socket 771 are still known as Socket T and J after Tejas and j -Hawk. So yeah, it's good to know it wasn't all for nothing. And finally, Tejas and j -Hawk, where did these names come from? To which he replied, I think it is named after a park or river in Texas. Not sure about Jayhawk. The project leads in Texas wanted a name with a more local identity. One shouldn't put too much weight on such project names, as often it may be simply based on the whims of a more influential manager that also passes the approval of the legal department. I do like the subtle undertone in that last sentence, but anyway, there you go. Probably a place in Texas, which is quite suitable given they're both quite warm. So there you have it, the story of Tejas and Jayhawk with some brand new information 18 years after the project was cancelled. And man, I'm a bit sad these chips never made it into production because I would have loved to have seen a 7 GHz Pentium 4-like CPU to go to make it to the market so we could get to play with it, but probably not very suitable for the average consumer. I do think Intel made the right call to cancel the project, but nevertheless all we have now is these chips and while it's unlikely we'll ever get them to work, we perhaps could try to delete one and see what kind of silicon is underneath, but that is for a different video. And I would really like to thank Steve Fisher for taking the time to respond to my questions and emails. That has really been a, a privilege to be sharing this information with you guys. And I really hope you have enjoyed it. If you have a like, we would very much appreciate it. 
and why not subscribe to the fully buffered channel? In any case, that was all for now and bye bye.